So this year, we at the Huffington Ecumenical Institute decided to move away from the trajectory that our earlier conferences followed. Instead of addressing another issue from the past, remember last year we addressed the events of 100 years, uh, 100 years old. Before that, we addressed the events 500 years old. Well, we decided with the consent of our advisory board to pick up a very modern and burning issue. In contrast with our previous topics, the topic this year uh, seems to be more political than theological, ecumenical and historical. Well, immigration may look too political and too recent, but if we look at it again, we may realize that it is theological, ecumenical and ancient. Well, Joseph and Mary, with the baby Jesus in their hands, sought asylum in Egypt, fleeing the madness of the dictator in their home country. The collapse of the western part of the uh, Christianized Roman Empire in the 5th century was the result of the so-called barbarian invasion. Scholars nowadays prefer to call it a great immigration of peoples. Indeed, it was one of the largest immigration crises in the period of late antiquity. Augustine addressed it, addressed it theologically in his masterpiece on the city of, of God. Two centuries later, a part of the Christian East were conquered by the newly emerged political superpower of Islam, which thus caused new waves of, of migration, struggle and preserving identity and assimilation. The reformation in Europe and religious co conflicts it caused, including the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century, incurred massive displacement of populations. Quite a few Englishmen did not want to, conf uh, to conform with the interpretation and practice of the Reformation by the Tudors and Stuarts in England. These nonconformists had to immigrate and eventually landed at the shores of what would be New England. There, they established a polity which became one of the main ingredients in the American melting pot. Mel melting pot. In my personal judgment, it was broth. Every other wave of immigrants to the United States, Irish, Italian, German, Greek, Middle Eastern, Balkan, etc., added to the richness and nutrition value in the American port. What we experience now as immigration crisis seems huge to us, but it is really small when we compare it with what we can see in the past. Yet, this experience is painful for both sides of migration the side that receives immigrants and the immigrants themselves. Well, I personally experience this every time I cross the US border at LAX. We're going to tell a lot of personal stories. I want to begin this uh, with my personal stories. So frequent trips abroad are part of my job at the Huffington Ecumenical Institute. Sometimes I have to, to leave and return to the US every other week, sometimes even every week over weekends, of course, not to miss my classes. It is easy to cross the border when you leave this country. It takes five or 10 minutes only, but it is really hard and increasingly so to enter, enter it. Last week I was in Bosnia and Herzegovina participate, participate, participating in a Catholic Orthodox dialogue. I landed at LAX on Monday at around 8 p.m. After waiting for more, more than an hour in line to present the office and my passport, I was led to a special room to be checked again. This has been my routine since 2017 approximately. So they check, they have checked me, I don't know, 20, 30 times, and they continue checking me. Uh, I waited there in this room for more than three hours and came ho home at 1 a.m. Last month, I've, I came back to LA with the same flight that landed at 8 p.m. and I came home at 2 a.m. In the morning at 8 a.m. I had my classes. The four officers at the detention room at LAX did not look very pleased with the people they were dealing with. Some of the, uh, some of the officers were not particularly polite, I would say. Uh, for example, they yell when someone tried to check his or her cell phone. The visitors in the room were not happy either. After flying for 10 or more years, uh, more hours, excuse me, not yes, uh, hours. I spent that day on planes, 22 hours. They have to wait three or four or so, uh, so uh, hours more. The majority of the people in that room uh, with me were international students uh, studying in the universities in Los Angeles. Fortunately, well, most of them, I hope everyone, uh, were eventually allowed to enter the US. We know, however, that there are students who are not so lucky. 
Some of them are undocumented. They were brought to the United States by their parents uh, when they were young and entered the higher education under such programs as DACA. In sociological studies, they are described as the 1.5 generation. It means that they came uh, with their parents, who were the first generation immigrants to the US, but they were brought here as, chi as children, and therefore they are 1.5 generation. We, we know that there are many such students at LMU. Others started, others started their university studies in their home countries, but could not complete them because of war and other conflicts. Uh, they came to the, to the US and do not know what to do with their un, uh, unfinished degree. Many universities in this country do not know what to do with these students either. All this issue will be in the focus of our conference today. We have invited a number of distinguished speakers uh, from Europe and the United States who know the immigration issue from the first hand and, and study it professionally. I will introduce each speaker before their presentation. Now let me explain the structure of our conference this year. It is a bit different uh, from what we had previously. Uh, we will have three separate session, sessions. In the first session, we will listen to the witnesses and stories about the situation in the countries which, uh, uh, which refugees live. In the second session, we will, we will give floor to the representatives of different churches in, in the Los Angeles area. They will tell us how the churches comfort the communities of immigrants. I'd like to note here that we have invited the representatives of the local churches in Los Angeles to our, our conference because we believe that immigration is not just a political crisis, but also an ecumenical opportunity. Sometimes when churches have a direct theological dialogue, they go to each other in opposite dire directions and thus miss one another. I sometimes represent this dialogue, the, the kind of formal and official dialogue, dialogue like, like this. They move towards each other and they often just miss one another, like that. Um, however, when they aim at a common goal together, which has social importance, they have a better chance to meet one another. In other way, if they move towards a common goal like that, there are more chances that they meet each other than just you know, going to, uh, uh, to confront each other in the, in the dialogue. Uh, taking care of immigrants in such a social import, uh, is such a socially important goal. For this exactly reason, we have chosen the picture for the posters of our conference. You can see it on the screen. It was taken at the Greek island of Lesbos, or Mytilini, which Pope Francis and the Archbishop of Athens, Hieronymus II, he's in the corner here, left corner of the picture, uh, visited together during the peak of the refugees uh, influx from the Middle East to Greece via Turkey. Uh, Mytilene, Lesbos is very close to Turkey. It's actually, you can swim actually from Turkey to Mytilene if you're strong enough. Uh, and people arrive in boats, you know, small boats from Turkey to, uh, to Greece. Uh, when the founder of our institute, Michael Huffington, and I visited the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome last July and saw this painting there, it's actually it's a big pi uh, picture uh, at the back of the main uh, conference hall at the institute. Uh, we immediately decided to use it for the poster of this conference as, as a, as, as, and also as an icon of the topic that we are going to discuss. I believe it is indeed an icon of ecumenism in its charitable dimension. Without this dimension, ecumenism would be dry, bare, and insincere. With this dimension, though, it can bring us faster to the desired unity than the usual theological instruments, I believe. Finally, the third session of our conference will focus on the problem of immigrant students, what the churches, governments, and universities uh, can do to make their talent and knowledge work in their new countries. After each session, we'll have a panel discussion with the speakers. Originally, we planned to have you know, Q&A uh, Q &A, uh, Q &A session after each presentation, but then we decided to have a larger discussion after each session in the panel. So the presenters will sit here and you will be able to ask them questions. Um, after the last panel, I invite you to join us for the reception at 6.30 p.m. You will not regret it, it's going to be good. Uh, so uh, after, this, uh, uh, after this motivation address, if you want, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, who is Mor Polikarpus. 
I, I will say a few words about him before uh, he comes here. He has been the Metropolitan of the Syriac Orthodox Church in the Netherlands since uh, 2007. Native uh, of Nizibis, now Nuzaybin, the ancient border city in what is now Southeast Turkey. The city is located on the very border of Turkey with Syria. If you go to a recreation park there, as I did, I visited Nizibis some time ago, and you see actually from the recreation park where you enjoy your soda, you know, your ice cream, the barbed wire. And behind the wire is, this, is Syria, actually. You can, you can see the Syrian, Syriac territory, uh, the territory of Syria from there. Um, and uh, that's why you understand that a lot of, uh, a lot of ref refugees from Syria come to, well, to that area because it's, it's easy to cross. Nizibis, though, uh, was really famous in the world of, uh, of antiquity. It used to be one of the major educational centers in, in that period of time, in the late antiquity. The famous Nizibis school uh, was run by people like Sen, um, uh, Sen Ephraim, uh, the Syrian. After the Persian invasion in the early three, uh, 360s, however, it moved to Edessa and constituted the core of the famous school of Edessa. Sen Ephraim, the Syrian, whom I mentioned already, probably the most important figure in the Syriac theological tradition, was born there and lived there because, before he had to move to Edessa uh, as a result of the Persian, Persian invasion. Um, so Nizibis is also an, in the neighborhood of Turabdin, which is, I would say, the heart of Syriac Christianity in the Middle East. The Syrian minority there experienced many persecutions and even genocides during the 20th century. We know about the Armenian genocide, but we know less about the, uh, the Syrian and Assyrian genocide, which also happened on the same, on the same soil. Uh, now what remains uh, of, the Syrian, of the Syrian Orthodox presence in Turabdin faces again the refugees crisis, which, had, uh, which has badly affected the area. Turabdin sits on the route exactly of the Syrian refugees from, coming from Turkey, some uh, uh, from Syria to Turkey. Some of them continue their way to the west. I hope more Polikarpos could tell us more about the situation in his homeland and about his care, the care of his church, about the refugees in, in Europe. He studied theology and Syriac studies in London, Oxford, and New, and New York, among other places, and he obtained his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. Saidna, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you so much for the kind invitation extended to me to speak to you today about the situation of Christians in the Middle East, current trends and prospects. In the course of the last 70 years or so, there has been a truly remarkable growth of interest in the Orient. And the recent political events in the Middle East have brought the Oriental slash Eastern Christians and other religious minorities to the global attention. In the course of my talk today, I shall first give an account of the current situation of Christian and other religious minorities in the Middle East, especially in the light of developments after the Arab Spring. Secondly, I shall consider the situation of the Middle Eastern immigrants and refugees in the Western diaspora vis-a-vis their access to higher education and the responsibility of the state and churches in this regard. In his article, The Situation of Christians in the Middle East and North Africa, Matthias Riemenschneider, the coordinator for religion and values in the politics and consulting department of the Konrad Adorno Stiftung in Berlin, reports on the deteriorating situation of Christians in the Middle East, situating them in a historical context. He says, the Middle East and North Africa are the cradle of not only Christianity, but also of two other great religions, Judaism and Islam. Despite a mutual origin, pressure is building up on the Christians in the region. 
The Christian community, although well acquainted with its minority situation in the eventful history of the Orient, is increasingly losing faith in a future that guarantees them a secure existence. Riemann Schneider goes on to say, in an expanding Islam in the Arab world, where tensions in society and economy are additionally exacerbated by a religious narrative, the living quality for Christians as a minority among Muslims is restricted manifold, even up to a targeted terrorist attacks. Christians are not only turning their backs to Iraq, where the situation for Christians at present is the most threatening to find better living conditions in other countries. The CAS International Report by Riemann Schneider, published in January 2011, points out that the number of the Christians in the Middle East has dwindled over the years. It states that a century ago, the percentage of Christians in the population of the Middle East was about 20%, whereas today it is only nearly 5%. However, in the face of current events taking place in the Middle East, there is a tendency of further decline in numbers. Today, there are approximately 15 million Christians left in the Middle East, about 10 million living in Egypt, and the rest are spread in the countries of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Turkey, and the Holy Land. According to Riemann Schneider, it is not appropriate to generally speak about the persecution situation of Christian. He contends that the situation of the individual countries of the Middle East and North Africa is too different and needs to be looked at closer. <coughs> Upon examining the situation of individual countries, Riemann Schneider concludes, I quote, an objective description of living conditions of Christians in the Arab countries must point out a series of shortcomings. Such a description contains, however, also the understanding that the greater number of religious conflicts are caused by social and political tensions, where religion is exploited for other purposes." End of the quote. The report also makes a reference to an extraordinary Middle East Synod, which was called for by Pope Benedict and held in Rome on October 10th through 24th, 2010. In a current publication of Pro Oriente, entitled Middle Eastern Christians Facing Challenges, Reflections on the Special Synod for the Middle East, which represents a collection of articles edited by Professor Dietmar Winkler, a patristic scholar and church historian at Salzburg University, Austria, remarks of the Middle East Synod saying, I quote, it was a milestone for Middle Eastern Christianity, charged with hopes for the challenged churches in their difficult situations in the midst of a region in radical change. End of the quote. Furthermore, the book of the Middle, on the Middle East Synod includes contribution by scholars specialized in the history and theology of Eastern slash Oriental Christianity, as well as Eastern and Western prominent church leaders, including Mor Gregorius Johanna Ibrahim, the Syriac Orthodox Metropolitan of Aleppo, who together with the fellow Metropolitan Bulus Yazji of the Greek Rome Orthodox were kidnapped on April 22, 2013. Hence, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, All right. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, the articles within this book shed light on the fla uh, fluctuating situation and the grave future of Christians in their homeland in the Middle East, and the relatively peaceful yet more challenging life in the Western diaspora. 
The volume treats the following eight subjects, several of which are relevant for the theme of our conference today. On the way to the Synod for the Middle East, which was in fact convened in Slemania, Iraq, the Special Synod for the Middle East, Ecumenical Implications, Christian-Jewish Implications, Christian-Muslim Implications, Church-State Implications, Diaspora Implications, and Appendices. The main focus of these articles is on relations. That's to say, on Christians and churches within their socio-political, religious, and ecclesial milieus. This means that ecumenical relations and communi communion are at stake, as well as relationships, witness and dialogue with Jews, Muslims, and their respective states, together with new relations in the West because of emigration and diaspora. Shortly after the extraordinary Middle East Synod, which had given some hope to the Christians in the Orient, a civil war began in Syria. It has devastated the entire country and its neighbors. This is a complex conflict that involves several nations, rebel groups and terrorist organizations. What started as a peaceful protest in 2011 quickly escalated into full-blown warfare. Since the fighting began, thousands upon thousands of people have been killed with over one million injured and millions more forced to flee their homes and live as refugees in different parts of the world, particularly in the West. A year ago, in fact, I was in Amsterdam staying at uh, Ambassade Hotel and there was uh, a meeting of poets, a Syrian poet by the name Ghayath al Madhun was invited to recite his poetry in Arabic. So I was asked to attend. It was quite interesting in one of his poems entitled Adrenaline. Because Ghayath al Madhun is of Palestinian and Syrian backgrounds. His father is Palestinian and his mother is Syrian. He fled. Syria and took refuge in Sweden and only after obtaining his Swedish passport he was able to visit his home country Palestine. The interesting thing about Ghayat al-Madhun was the following. He said I have never arrived in the West. He said before you come to the West you really gather yourself your power and energy to come to the West. And when you reach the West, you feel really happy. But after two or three months, then you are lost. So what he does mentally is say, I have never arrived. He moves from one place to the other, always on the move and the journey in a way to console himself that he is on a journey and he has that energy to move forward. And he has written poetry which is political and very powerful in many ways and translated into many languages. Nuri Kino, an investigative journalist from Sweden, in his recent article, Witness to the Unimaginable, published originally in Swedish by Access magazine, also reports about the decline of the Christian population in Syria and the ongoing persecution there. He says, I quote, according to former British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt's report, in Syria, the Christian population has declined from 1.7 million in 2011 to below 450,000. And the persecution continues. The latest terrorist attack on a church in Syria occurred on July 11th this year. A few days later, a six-year-old Armenian teacher, Suzanne Dir Kirkors, body was found. She had been kidnapped, raped, and then stoned to death. She was one of the last Christians in Yakubie, a city in the province of Idlib in Syria. 
End of the quote. Furthermore, reflecting back on the invasion of Iraq and the persecution of Christian and other religious components of Iraq, Kino states, I quote, Iraq was invaded by the United States and its allies in March 2003. In September of that year, the abductions of Christians began. Those who did not pay the ransom to bring home their relatives got them back in a bag, sometimes in five parts. Hundreds of churches were attacked many times during service. Priests, nuns, and bishops were kidnapped or killed. Yazidis and Mandeans and Kakai, who are also non-Muslim indigenous people, were also attacked in the same brutal way. End of the quote. Kino then goes on to talk about the ethno-religious cleansing of non-Muslims in Iraq that culminated in genocide. He states, I quote, In the summer of 2014, the genocide reached its peak and millions of people were displaced. Entire cities and provinces were emptied of their population. ISIS boasted about their atrocities in front of cameras. They prided themselves on the slaughter of non-Muslims but also of Shiites and other Muslims who did not follow ISIS doctrine." End of the quote. Middle East in a, is a sta in a state of turmoil. The ongoing Syrian civil war and the involvement of the neighboring and other countries, whether directly or indirectly, is affecting the entire region with implication for the rest of the world. The war in particular is affecting the Christian and other religious minorities in the region. The past persecution of the Middle Eastern Christians in the late 19th and the early 20th century, as Father Cyril has mentioned about the genocide of the Armenian, Syriac, and Pontus Greeks, forced many of the survivors to take refuge in the Western world, especially in the North and South Americas. The ongoing persecution of the Christians and other minority groups today in the Middle East has also led many of them to seek asylum in the West. The emigration of large-scale people from the Middle East and other war-torn countries in the West has changed the landscape and the cultural identity of Europe and North America. Thus, the Council of Europe Standing Committee on Culture, Science and Education reported about the existence of the diaspora culture, saying, I quote, Diaspora cultures exist as a result of the dispersion of communities throughout the world. This dispersion is often false or has historical reasons. Diaspora communities represent and maintain a culture different from those of the countries within which they are located, often retaining strong ties with their country and culture of origin, real or perceived, and with other communities of the same origin in order to preserve that culture. This is an essentially cultural phenomenon and is not necessarily linked to immigration. End of the quote. Having said this, now I'd like to shed some light on the cultural and ecclesiastical relations between East and West, which go back to the early 1500s. Since this is important for the future growth and development of Syriac and Oriental studies in Europe, as well as the support of the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox Christians in the West. This also may inspire us today in our attitude towards the migrants and their access to education. One particular example is the visit of the Syrian Orthodox monk priest Mushe of Sauro near Mardin in Mesopotamia to Rome. Mushe was commissioned by the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch Abdullah I in the 16th century to print the Syriac New Testament. He arrived in Rome sometime before 1540. 49, and had an audience with Pope Paul III. During his stay in Rome, Musha learned Latin and some Italian, and at the same time taught Syriac to two students named Andreas Matius and Johann Albrecht Widmanstetter. He also, among other things, composed a Syriac translation of the Roman Mass. Soon after this arrival in Rome, Musha began researching how to set up a Syriac press to print the Syriac New Testament, a project which led him eventually to Germany 
and brought him into contact with Guillaume Postel, a French humanist, and with Manstetter, who had received a manuscript of Syriac New Testament with instructions about the Syriac language from Teseo Ambrogio, the first European to learn Syriac. Wittmannstetter later studied Syriac under a Maronite bishop named Simeon, and in 1533 he managed to transcribe a manuscript of the Syriac New Testament from the library of Ptolemy at Siena. Thus he had a similar interest to that of Mushi in having the Syriac New Testament printed. Finally, Wittmannstetter took Mushi with him to Vienna and managed to secure funding from Emperor Ferdinand for the Syriac New Testament, which was printed in Vienna in 1555. Another relevant example is that the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch Ignatius of Taibuthe Dalovo, again in the 16th century, who was knowledgeable in medicine, mathematics, as well as philosophy and art. Because of his knowledge in medicine, he became the confidant of the local Muslim ruler in Diyarbakir in modern day Turkey, also known in Armenian, the Kranagert. The local Muslims, officers at court, accused the governor of listening too much to the Patriarch and they wished to execute the Patriarch. However, the Patriarch abdicated and then escaped in disguise to the West. He arrived in Rome carrying with him a collection of scientific and other books, of which six were printed by the Medicis in Italy. Patriarch Ignatius had an audience with Pope Gregory on January 30th, 1578. He was invited to join the Papal Commission on Calendar Reform and wrote an extensive criticism of the compendium, the reform proposal which was sent by Pope Gregory to all Catholic princes. Moving from the middle, sorry. Moving from the Middle Ages to the modern times, we see that despite significant migration waves, until the early 21st century, the majority of Eastern Christians lived in the Middle East. With the current dramatic change taking place in the Middle East, it is now possible to say that there are more Eastern Christians living in the West than in the Middle East. Consequently, emigration from the Middle East, the birthplace of Christianity, and the other two monotheistic religions, namely Judaism and Islam, led to the establishment of the Middle Eastern people and the growth of Oriental studies in the West. Dialogue and encounter between people of different cultures and traditions is a major blessing and enrichment for the people involved and the world at large. For example, the cultural and scientific dialogue between the Jews, Christians and Muslims during the Abbasid era in Baghdad was a major enrichment. Furthermore, the knowledge of the Syriac monks and scholars who had acted as a culture bridge between East and West in translating the Greek classics into Syriac and then from Syriac into Arabic was immensely important for the spread of knowledge and sciences among different people and nations in the East. Thanks to the Syriac monks and scholars who later taught the Arabs how to translate the Greek classics directly from Greek into Arabic, led the Greek philosophy and sciences to reach Andalusia, which gave birth to Renaissance in Europe. As a matter of fact, there is a BBC documentary entitled The Forgotten Christians about the Syriac Christians and scholars. He says, if it wasn't for the Syriac scholars, most probably Renaissance would not have come to Europe, emphasizing the role that the Syriac scholars and especially the monks played in translating the Greek classic from Greek into Syriac and from Syriac into Arabic and later teaching the Arabs how to translate directly from Greek into Sur uh, Arabic. It is true that large-scale emigration from the traditional homeland in the Middle East to the West has brought problems and challenges to the traumatized Eastern people and communities. It has nevertheless led to a greater awareness among other Christian churches and host countries and communities, both of their existence and of the richness of their theological, spiritual, and intellectual tradition. 
While the challenges that face the Eastern churches and communities at the beginning of the millennium are numerous and formidable, new opportunities are nevertheless also present. As Huffington Ecumenical Institute rightly recognizes that the refugee crisis is not only as a challenge, but also as an ecumenical opportunity. Thereby, it gives churches a chance to address it in a way that would bring them closer to one another. Therefore, church solidarity in helping immigrants can also help them overcome many of their old disagreements and mutually enriching them. There is uh, this uh, understanding by the French Jewish philosopher uh, Levinas, uh, who says it is through encounter, uh, th hospita hospitality as an encounter of knowing the other with capital O and with uh, smaller O. So the more we make a room in our life and heart for the others, we come to know ourselves. We really cannot know ourselves fully. We come to know ourselves through the other. By knowing about the other, we come gradually to know ourselves even better. And there is... Uh, also, uh, the uh, correspondence between a student from France who won a scholarship to study in England. She writes to her professor saying, I want a scholarship for a year to go and study abroad in England. The professor congratulates her and then he says, now you know yourself, but after a year you will know yourself even better. This tells us that it is through encounter with other people who question us, who ask us questions. Who are you? Where do you come from? What language do you speak? What's your culture? What's your tradition? How do you say that? How do you do this? Then we come to know about ourselves. We come to understand we are different from the other. And this way, by formulating the answers for the questions, Post to the others about us become to become aware of ourselves and know ourselves. Anna Rowlands of Durham University in the UK, in her Sydney talks, Catholic Social Teaching and the Other, Practicing Communion, she lists six principles for approaching migration. She says right to remain, duty to protect. Second, right to migrate to seek protection and human flourishing. Third, the duty of the state to offer protection to migrants. Fourth, right to regulate borders according to the common good, but must be porus and humane. Fifth, the duty of the host community to welcome, protect, and allow opportunity for full life in community, civic, religious and social. And finally, fundamental dignity of the migrants as sign of the human condition and as icon of the church's nature. And this is given in a circular fashion. Furthermore, she elaborates of Pope Francis four, uh, four verbs, namely to welcome, to protect, to promote and to integrate. She says, to conjugate these four verbs is duty of justice, civility, and solidarity. And she brings examples from the Bible as well, the biblical migrant community. And in a way, we are all migrants. And from the church faith perspective, we are also pilgrims on the face of the earth. And we have uh, also the famous uh, letter uh, to Diogenetus uh, says, every uh, local Christian is a foreign, and every foreigner is local or something like that, if I cannot remember rightly. So in a sense that the Christian faith recognizes no borders. And by bearing this in mind, it is very important that the churches who 
do not have borders, but the states that have borders, to create a space. And this way, through this encounter with one another, to exchange the blessing that people have. Because every individual has something to offer the other. And in this way, to complete one another, to enrich one another, and to create a better world for all of us here. I would like also to give the example of hospitality for the migrants from my adopted kingdom of the Netherlands. This is about the refugees, an asylum seeker from Southeast Anatolia in Turkey in the late 70s and early 80s, seeking refuge in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Thanks to the Chast Chazin system, the host family system, which was developed by the National Council of Churches in the Netherlands and partially supported by the local government municipalities, which enabled the Syriac community and other immigrants to integrate and establish themselves in the Netherlands. This was a mutually enriching and beneficial to both sides. And the children of those immigrants who had host Dutch family to help them with language and culture, education and work are now very successful in their life. They have retained the essential elements of their Syriac identity, but also embraced the identity of the host country. The way it worked was the following. Every Dutch family was would be given a Syriac immigrant family. And that family would help them, coach them as it were, to learn the language, to learn the system, to have education. And they would exchange. And then they would cultivate friendship. And this friendship lasts until this very day. Then I realized that children of those families, they really have a strong identity. They have learned this Dutch language and culture, but they are also strong in their Syriac identity. And now they are contributing to the well-being of the Dutch society and country at large. Of course, one should bear in mind that identity is something dynamic and not static, as elaborated by the French-Lebanese novelist I mean Malouf in his long essay entitled In the Name of Identity. According to Amin Malouf, identity is static because it's shaped and formed by education, by environment, by experience and growth. It cannot be static. If it's static, it can be deadly. So therefore he says you cannot even compartmentalize identity. He is giving an example about himself. He is from Lebanon but he is living in France and he is writing in French. He is very much at home in Arabic in Lebanon but also in French uh, in France. And quite often people tap you on the shoulder saying that I mean what are you? Are you really French or Lebanese? And the answer is that you cannot compartmentalize identity. A particularly acute aspect of the refugee crisis is access to higher education. Education in universities and colleges is being increasingly recognized as a basic human right. Many younger immigrants, however, cannot exercise this right when they arrive to a safer country. Many of them having studied in a college in their home country cannot continue studies after they leave it. In fact, in the Netherlands, I was also approached by a number of theological seminaries and some universities to tell them if there were immigrants coming from Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere who would be willing to study and they would provide scholarship for them. And that's really, really good. And you see some of these immigrants who really excel in education, they contribute also to 
the society, to politics, and to the culture at large. And we had also, I think, the famous uh, uh, African uh, immigrant to the Netherlands, who is now in the United States, the author of The Infidel. Her name escapes my memory at the moment. Yeah, Herj Ayan Hershi Ali. I mean, she was an immigrant and, in fact, then entered the politics in uh, the Netherlands and became a very prominent uh, politician. And then she had to leave because she was very critical of certain groups in the Netherlands and the world at large. Having said this, I shall now look at some of the challenges that face the immigrant community in North America and Europe today. One of these is secularism. The word secular is defined differently, of course, by different people and may be viewed as something positive or negative, largely depending on the culture, political state, or background one comes from. For instance, a Christian who comes from a major minority group in a dominant Muslim society, such as Turkey, or a dominant Hindu society such as India may view secularism as something good and positive because this state of affairs works for their benefit. In a secular country, due to a separation between state and religion, people to a varying degree are free to leave their faith and express their religious convictions. On the other hand, for a Christian who comes from a traditional Orthodox country like Greece or Romania, Secularism may be seen as something negative and in opposition to the church. In the case of the Syriac community in North America and Western Europe, secularism has a more negative connotation than a positive one. While it's through that, one should be grateful to live in a country like America or Europe where we are free to worship and maintain our faith in the way we want. Nevertheless, secularism poses for us a real challenge and difficulty. This is because secularism is removing the religion from being at the center of people's life, leaving it to play a lesser role in the life of the community. Furthermore, this burdens and places more responsibility on the shoulders of the parents and the clergy to direct the faithful in matters of religion and God. But in the secular state of America or Europe today, usually the tide is against the church. I'd like to bring also the example of the so-called Birkenferde dictum, which was stated by Ernest Wolfgang Birkenferde, a German uh, judge of the Supreme Court, who stated, I quote, the liberal secular state lives, lives on conditions that it cannot guarantee itself. That is the great venture the state has made for the sake of freedom. On the one hand, as a free state, it can only exist if the freedom it grants to its citizens is regulated from within, from the moral substance of the individual and the homogeneity of society. On the other hand, the state cannot seek to guarantee these internal regulatory forces on their own initiative. That is to say, by means of legal compulsion an authoritative command without giving her freedom and on a secular level falling back into the totality claim from which the state led in the denominational civil wars." End of the quote. By way of conclusion, I would like to say that it is true that emigration from the land of the forefathers in the Semitic biblical world out of which the Bible and Christianity sprang has depopulated the area of Christians and their witness to Christ and left many sacred and cultural monuments of great beauty and magnificence to be destroyed and left in desolation. Moreover, the recent tragic developments in the Middle East have threatened the very existence of the Middle Eastern Christians in their ancestral homelands. The war in Iraq and now in Syria has not only claimed the life of many people, and led to the kidnapping of a number of prominent religious leaders and monastics, but also forced very large number of the Middle Eastern Christians to emigrate to the West, where they find themselves having to adapt to a new life in a society that is deeply secularized and to a certain extent unconcerned with their plight. On the other hand, we find some 
signs of hope for the future. The Western diaspora has opened new horizons and offered some opportunities for the Eastern people and communities, especially in the fields of education. Conversely, the Western diaspora has given the opportunity for the Western churches to come into direct contact with and learn from the experience of the different Eastern and Syriac churches with their own rich and distinctive history of spiritual heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shukran. Our next speaker today is Tom Slay. I learned about Tom from his books on the refugees in the Middle East and Africa. Well, he describes himself as, as I quote, donning flag jacket and helmet, working as a journalist inside militarized war zones and refugee camps, a sort of Rambo Jr. Tom knows very well the situation which produces waves of um, refugees and can describe this situation in comprehensive and, I would say, entertaining way, his own way. The New York Times book review has described, uh, has described Tom's style as following, again, I quote, he embeds lines of poetry in journalistic essays like a rogue reporter. Conversely, he'll forge a son sonnet or rhymed tessets out of reported language. Well, Tom is an author of 10 books of poetry, including Army Cats, which is the winner of the John Updike Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and Spice Walk, which won the 100,000 Kinsley Tufts Award. In addition, Far Side of the Earth won the, uh, an Academy Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. The uh, Dream House was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award the Chain was a finalist for the Lenore Marshall Prize. Station Z was published in 2015 and includes his long poem about Iraq, Homage to Basho, a version of which received Poetry Magazine's Editor's Prize. <clears throat> in 2018, a book of prose collecting his essays on refugees in the Middle East, The Land Between Two Rivers, which is a reference to Mesopotamia, of course, writing in an age of refugees, is being published simultaneously by Grey Wolf Pe uh, Press as a companion piece to <clears throat> House of Facts, House of Ruin, his latest book of poems. He has al uh, also published a previous, uh, previous book of essays, interview with a, a ghost and a translation of Euripides uh, Heracles. Widely un uh, anthologized, his poem prose appear in the New Yorker, Virginia Quarterly Review, Poetry, American Poetry Review, Yale Review, Three Penny, The Village Voice, and other literary magazines, as well as the Best of the Best American Poetry, The Best American Poetry, Best American Travel Writing, and the uh, Pushcart Anthology. He has received the uh, Shelley Prize from the Poetry Society of America, a fellowship from the American Academy in Berlin, a fellowship at the uh, Civitella Ranieri Foundation, and Individual Writers Award from the Lila Wallace Reader, uh, Reader's Digest Fund a Guggenheim grant, and to National Endowment for the Arts grants, among many other things. He's a distinguished pro professor in, uh, uh, in MFA program at Hunter College and lives in Brookline. During the last decade, he has also worked as a journalist in Syria, Lebanon, Somalia, Kenya, Iraq, and Libya. Tom, we are grateful uh, that you accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Well, first off, uh, can everybody hear me? Folks in the back? Okay. Um, I just want to say right off the bat that when I um, got the invitation uh, from Cyril to read, I immediately felt um, that I needed to qualify <laughs> um, what it is that I do uh, because I, I don't have anything uh, general to say. Uh, that's just not the kind of thing that I, I do. Um, but the th one of the things that I'm just so struck by in listening to that wonderful talk we just heard was uh, despite kind of, you know, my initial um, diffidence about accepting the invitation, uh, 
I was uh, amazed at how many threads uh, you laid down, which in fact I've also uh, picked up. And uh, I can certainly talk about those, but just in, in, a, in, just in terms of just what you were talking about, uh, your very beautiful um, explanation of Lev Levinas's concept of encounter um, also sparked off in me, you know, one of the prime commandments, one of the main things that people often say about Levinas is the, is the um, absolute moral obligation when you're in the presence of the, of the other is to say, do not kill me. And that is a kind of foundational sense of the self is one of the things that I have uh, noticed, uh, seen time and time again, uh, and have seen violated repeatedly, um, more violated than observed, I must say. And um, the things that I have to say today um, come from a you know, wide variety of experiences that I've had. Um, I was so interested to hear you talking about uh, Syria uh, because when I was in um, uh, Jordan, Amman, Jordan, I met a young uh, Syrian refugee uh, who we hit it off in certain ways. And um, uh, he was a you know, devotee of um, the martial arts. And I'm a, an amateur devotee of the martial arts. And we ended up in front of a cafe in which I was showing him moves from uh, Tai Chi and he was showing me moves from karate and making fools of ourselves. And then I was able to convince him that I would like to come work with him uh, in the bakery where he worked. And so we spent you know, uh, several days. Uh, he taught me how to make Arabic sweets. And so, uh, all of these threads uh, were so present to me as you were speaking. Uh, I was in Iraq uh, just as ISIS uh, came down, um, and it was a very bloody time. Um, and I just want to say to all of you, I'm very grateful to be here. It's not a context that I often get a chance to appear in. I'm really uh, happy. When I read the um, biographies of everybody, I thought, my God, these people really know things. <laughs> and I was uh, deeply, uh, I'm deeply pleased to be here. So I will now shut up and get to the business at hand. But first I want to thank Cyril for putting this together. And I, and I also want to thank Margaret Butterfield, where is she? There she is. Thank you. And all of you. Um, so by way, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to read or, a little bit of an introduction because I feel it's important that when you write about refugee issues in the way that I do is you do understand the context that I'm writing from. Um, and then I will read the pieces that I have for you. Uh, I've tried to structure them in such a way that there's a kind of comprehensive view. I'm, but uh, you'll be the judge of that. Um, I want to be completely candid with you. My experience with refugees has been mainly of people who are fairly secular. That is, their Christian or Muslim values are mainly social and tribal and not necessarily devotional. So while I'd like to be able to say that I could talk about interreligious dialogue, the truth is that religion only comes into my stories as a kind of background radiation. It conditions people's relations with one another, but it isn't exactly visible in its precise effects. All I can do then is tell the stories of people in their own unique situations. As Cyril said, before I started doing this kind of journalism, I'd spent most of my writing life as a poet publishing books of poetry, writing plays, a translation from Greek of Euripides' Heracles, and books of literary essays. In other words, I knew nothing about the subject. But back in 2007, I was asked to go to Lebanon and Syria after the 2006 Israeli-Lebanese War to write about Palestinian refugees. 
I didn't anticipate violence, but the moment my plane touched down in Beirut, a mini civil war broke out when a huge car bomb exploded in the ABC shopping mall. I remember traveling to Cana, and you'll remember Cana is supposedly the place where Jesus worked the first miracle, changing water into wine. And I always find that a very amusing, strange miracle because at a certain point, one of the guests turns to the bridegroom and says, how come you gave us the lousy wine before you served up the really good wine that Jesus just gave us? Naturally, there's another Cana in Israel. And in that, there is a whole um, subtext of um, conflict. Anyway, um, I remember traveling to Kana in southern Lebanon where the young man who took me there was one of the first members of the Red Cross allowed into the village after a bombing. In the smoke and semi-darkness, he came across a little girl buried up to her neck in rubble. So he dug down with his bare hands as far as her armpits, took hold of her under her arms, lifted her free and discovered she'd been blown in half. He looked as if he were about to tear up. I told him he didn't have to go on with his story, but he stared me in the eye and said, I'll tell you what happened, but you must promise to tell my story. I'd never felt such a sense of responsibility, almost a kind of commission in all my life. As to how a cultural outsider can tell the story, that's a different question. One thing I think is crucial, though, is to find a way to acknowledge the limits of what you can know and to be honest about what it is you don't know. So I try as hard as I can to avoid broad strokes and favor the small picture, the local details, and intimate truths that make up daily life. It can take me several years and several visits before I feel like a place has imprinted on my nervous system. Only then can I write about it convincingly, at least for myself. So today, I'll give you several instances of refugee life as I've experienced it. These examples won't be drawn solely from the Middle East, but will also extend to Africa. I could do strictly from the Middle East, but I wanted to extend uh, the range of the conference topic because I think it's important to see the commonalities among refugees from many different parts of the world, even though their historical and cultural predicaments are unique. That said, the context of these stories are often depressingly similar. When you write about refugees, you're almost always writing about a place where there is a war, has been a war, will be a war. So in the next half hour, we'll travel to six different parts of the world. A refugee camp in Kenya, a Palestinian community center in Amman, Jordan, the Syrian Golan Heights, a Somali neighborhood in Nairobi called Eastleigh, back to the United States where I offer a more personal reflection on what it's like to witness a famine in Mogadishu, and then back in time, 4,000 years, to ancient Iraq, where I'll conclude with a translation of a Babylonian poem about the destruction of the city of Ur. None of these instances is meant to have anything definitive to it. None is offered up as supplying a generalizable truth. And the time I spent with each of these people I try to honor their particular lives, their unique way of understanding what it means to be a refugee, as well as trying to give you the look and feel, the sights and sounds of their everyday lives. The piece is called, This Time the Good Ones Helped Us, but Next Time, Who Knows? One, the Dob Refugee Camp, Northern Kenya, 2011. Out over the desert's red sandy hard pan, studded with thorn and acacia trees, the ground was heating up. Soon, the air trapped inside my tent would grow claustrophobically hot, the desert pulsing like a migraine. 
Meanwhile, out beyond the UN fences and the camps, the refugees were also readying themselves for the day. But a day of waiting, particularly for the new arrivals. As many as a thousand a day had been arriving for several months, an advancing tide of refugees moving through country where mainly lions and hyenas and nomads have their territory. On foot, in trucks, in minivans, over red sand roads that turned to thigh-deep sinkholes in rain, but in the current drought, hide rocks and craters that can snap axles and blow out tires, the women wearing jill bobs, the men's faces plastered with dust, the refugees clutch their cell phones. Cell phones are so ubiquitous, even refugees use them, waiting for the call from their kin already in the camps. Scavenging marabou storks perch in the thorn trees, their pink heads bald because, as I read in a bird book, quote, a feathered head would become rapidly clotted with blood when the bird's head was inside a large corpse. In the heat haze scarfing the rocky desert, the marabou's eight-foot wingspan shadowed the refugees' progress toward the daub as they carried bundles under their arms or pushed broken-down carts, often women alone, shepherding children. One grandmother, accompanied by seven children, told me how Al-Shabaab bandits had attacked their bus. Al-Shabaab simply means the youth, and it is a um, Islamic uh, militia group uh, in uh, Somalia. Quote, they made us get down and then they beat the bus driver and robbed him of our fares and took everything they could carry. And then they beat the men, shouting at them that God is as great in Somalia as in Kenya, that they were running from God, running from their country. At the IFO field office, the refugees would huddle hour after hour under a UN canopy to hide from the sun as they lined up for registration and, re and reception. Needles jabbed in arms against polio and tetanus, vitamin B and C eye-dropped into the mouths of children, interviews in cubicles, biometric scans of face and fingerprints, fingerprints inked the old-fashioned way into a dossier, more questions and answers, questions and answers, any security issues, any known enemies. And then they'd be given flour, cooking oil, salt, sugar, soap, a kitchen set, jerry cans, roven grass sleeping mats, baby blue tarps, and a chance at a second life on a plot of ground the size of some people's living rooms. They'd be housed in tents, much like the ones I was staying in, only there'd be as many as seven people living in it. They'd be living in a camp in section X, block X, plot X. I remember talking with a young man named Abdi who had fled here to Dadaab, the largest refugee camp in the world located in northern Kenya, so he could escape the Ethiopian government's persecution of Oromos. In English, which he learned at his old secondary school, he told me how only last week he and his brother had been attacked in the camp by a group of refugees who hated their Christianity. They set fire to our church, he told me, and they tried to shoot my brother, but they missed. As we walked through the camp, passing by small plots of ground fenced in by woven acacia branches and thorn trees, each plot assigned to a family of 10 to 15 people, I asked him how that made him feel. He said, it was expected. They'd been threatening my brother for almost two weeks. But what wasn't expected was how several Muslim families helped to put out the fire. We have good neighbors and bad ones. This time, the good ones helped us. But next time, who knows? Two, Amman Jordan Palestinian Community Center, 2017. 
In my opinion, she said, a value isn't a value unless you live by it every day. Unless you live by it, it's only a theory. In a corner of the community center, where about a hundred young adult Palestinians were gathered to discuss ethics, I saw chalked on a blackboard 2AL plus 6H2O equals 2AL parens OH3 plus 3H2, the chemical notation for what happens when you combine aluminum atoms with water to produce hydrogen. So, if you claim to be a religious person, but you don't live according to the rules, then you really can't be said to be religious. She was dressed in a hijab, and as she talked, her face lit up with the intensity of her convictions. The older woman who was leading to the discussion wrote on the chalkboard, theory versus practice, and said, does everyone agree? There was a general nodding of heads when she said, so, let me ask this. Do you think that religion comes before values, or do our ethics shape religious practice? Religion gives us our values, said the young woman. There are so many ways to act that unless you have religion, you're only guessing between right and wrong. The leader turned to me and said, maybe our visitor would like to say something about this question. Perhaps she assumed I was secular, since I was American, or was she wrong? What came to mind, though, wasn't so much an answer as a conundrum. When my father was dying, I had the choice to tell him that he was dying or to keep it from him. I chose to keep it from him. Now, my father was an honest man and believed in telling the truth, but he wasn't a religious person at all. Does that mean I betrayed my father's values? The young woman began to nod vigorously and said, yes, absolutely. It's not an easy thing to do, but if you're a religious person, you must tell the truth. From the back of the room, a heavy-set young man said, but what about his father? He didn't want him to have to suffer not only his illness, but the knowledge that he would soon die from it. At least his father could still hope that he'd get better. And he said to me, I think you did the right thing. You may have lied, but you lied in the name of a higher value. But the young woman shook her head and said in an even more heated voice, I think that we have to choose between our own personal values and the values of religion. Sometimes they are the same, but when they aren't, you have to choose the values that God has given us. Three, a Palestinian village near Kanaitra, Syria, 2007. And I just want to say that uh, the views of the Palestinian man in this are, uh, I could see how some people would, uh, probably most people in a certain way would find them disturbing. The phrase raised to the ground had always seemed like literary artifice from histories of the war between Carthage and Rome. But in Kanitra, a Syrian town in the Golan Heights, the word was inescapable. Before pulling out of Kanitra at the end of the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the Israeli army evicted the 37,000 Syrian Arabs living there, then stripped billions, buildings of fixtures, windows, doors, anything that could be carted off right down to the hinges and knobs. Once a town was completely picked clean, bulldozers and tractors moved in and knocked down most of the buildings. It was odd disturbingly odd to hear birdsong in the clear, quiet air and to see a herd of cows, heads bowed to graze among what was somebody's home, now overgrown by flowers and weeds, roses run wild in what used to be somebody's garden. Now, Kanitra served the dual purpose 
of a Syrian memorial and a propaganda site. When later that day, I ducked into a carpenter's shop in a Palestinian camp near Kanaitra, I met an old man who invited me back to his home. His house was modest but comfortable. Cushions and an industrial-style brown carpet covered the concrete floor. A ceiling fan whirled overhead beside a modest chandelier. Family pictures and crockery were stacked in a wooden hutch, and plastic roses sat snug in a wall sconce. This was luxury compared to the bare, unadorned Palestinian homes I'd seen in Lebanon. The signs of domestic order, including an old computer and a TV, were hard won. All you see in our camp, we have built by ourselves, he told me. We do not have paved streets, no sewer system, no drinking water. People build their own sewage system, and it flows to an open outfall pipe at the end of the village. The international community keeps promising to improve things, but it's just a lot of noise. Nothing changes. Still, our lives here are much better than in Lebanon. At least in Syria, a Palestinian can work in any job, and we have most of the same rights as Syrian citizens. We're issued identity cards that are temporary, but they are valid until our return to Palestine. As he spoke, the room had filled with his neighbors in the camp who listened intently. Most of them were too young to have experienced the Nakba. The Nakba in Arabic means the catastrophe, uh, and in the Israeli side of that is the War of Independence. Catastrophe, War of Independence, you bridge the gap. Experience the Nakba, or even remember a time when the right of return still seemed a real possibility. The right of return, in case people don't know it, is that Palestinians uh, are still holding out the hope that they will be able to go back to what they think of as their homeland and reclaim their former houses. Many of them still have the keys, at least uh, that generation in the 48, uh, in their pockets. He paused a sip his tea, then continued in a low, strong voice, staring straight ahead. In 1948, the Israeli army invaded my village. Right before my eyes, they killed my mother and four of my brothers. My father was hit by a bullet and died. We left the house while shots were still being fired. I was three years old and I remember it with complete clarity. The house was blown up, and we were forced to go to Lebanon, then Syria. When we got here, we had nothing but tents. We had no shoes, no clothes against the cold. My first school was a tent, and my teacher wept for us. To live in such conditions in a tent was like living in a spider web and the heart of a well. I was raised here until preparatory school. Then I went to Damascus, to high school, and then to Saudi Arabia. He paused again to sip his tea, then said in a quiet voice, it was like a lake of blood, and the deeds are stained with blood. I assumed he was speaking in metaphors until he asked, would you like to see the deeds? He called his nephew on the cell phone, and a burly young man of about 20 arrived on a motorbike a few minutes later to show me the deeds to the family's property in what is now Israel. I could see that the paper was literally discolored with blood, the legalese obscured by three long, brown, faded stains. The deeds were found by accident when my uncle and cousin came over to our house after the soldiers dynamited it to see if there was anything they could do to help us. I saw my home blown up. But the worst thing I saw, the worst thing I ever saw, was my brother, still a baby, suckling at my dead mother's breast. 
This was no rehearsed performance trotted out for our benefit. The effort to say this, to remember it, had cost him, and it had also cost us to listen. The old man's words seemed to have nothing in common with the double speak of Lebanon's ruling elite or Syria's police state under Bashar al-Assad. But I found the old man had accusations and agendas as well. I kept thinking of a quote from the poet Robert Frost. Politics is an extravagance, he wrote, an extravagance about grievances. And poetry is an extravagance about grief. I confess that it was easier to accept the old man's grief than his grievance. His voice hardened and grew louder, almost fierce with accusation. The Israelis, he said, should return to the place where they came from. The Arab Jews, we love them. They are our brothers. But we wish that the colonial European Jews would go home to Europe. He paused for a moment and said, The blood of my brother is on these deeds. This proves that this land is for us and not for them. Our only hope is that America will wake up. The Jewish lobby manipulates American opinion, even though they know nothing about Palestinians. Daily, the Israelis commit crimes that Europe and America do nothing about. The Nazis' crimes are documented, and their crimes are as bad as the Nazis. The war criminals should be prosecuted, but the Americans help them. And as Arabs and Palestinians, we do not know how to talk with America and Europe. We must learn to do that better so that people in America will see the truth. I saw on Al Jazeera a film that told the story of Israeli crimes, but the Israelis know how to get their story told. My last word is this. We will resist the Jews by word, sword, until the last drop of blood. Four. UNHCR Intake Center, Nairobi, Kenya, 2009 to 2012. That's the United Nations uh, High Commission Refugees. Do you have an appointment for an interview? No, I, I don't have an appointment. So you haven't registered to get your UNHCR mandate? No, I haven't registered. Then you have to come back in two weeks' time for an interview. But how will we live for two weeks? We have no money. My son is sick. He needs help now. Or you would hear variants so gruesome that it was difficult to believe you were hearing what you were hearing. We had to flee from Congo. My neighbor's daughters were raped. The men who did it came back in the morning and threw the girls' heads in our yard. We need food. We need money. I'm sorry that happened. I wish I could help you. But you'll have to come back in two weeks. And though it sounds heartless, given the rules, what more could one say? I sat in on many hours of such UNHCR intake interviews, and Alan, who conducted them, was unfailingly polite, professional, sympathetic. Between Alan and the refugees, and their desire for UNHCR mandate, a document that would make their refugee status legal in Kenya and give access to medical care and free primary school for their children was a sheet of plexiglass and a computer. The huge workings of the bureaucracy in which Alan functioned was invisible. He was the human face they appealed to. And Alan was the one who had to tell them over and over again, I'm sorry, but... As one refugee put it, who claimed he had learned the system only to be denied refugee status, 
We come to UNHCR as if she were our mother. We ask her for bread, but she gives us a stone. But it turned out to be more complicated. He was a Rwandese Hutu who may have helped in the genocide committed against Tutsis. How could Alan presume that this man hadn't cut down his neighbors with a machete and was thus in violation of refugee status? UNHCR was not a mother, nor was the man a child. Unlike the Rwandese Hutu, most of the Somali women I talked to had only the vaguest notion about their rights to asylum. Issues of protection came up again and again. Clan warfare didn't end at the Kenyan border, not if you lived in Eastley, the little Mogadishu of Nairobi. In a 2007 study by Professor Kawo Abdi about the plight of Somali women since the civil wars broke out in the 1990s, rape has become so prevalent that women have taken to wearing pants, the tighter the better, under their robes. And if a woman admits to being raped, she runs the risk of being ostracized, divorced, or even married off to the rapist. No wonder most women keep that knowledge to themselves. In my many interviews with Somalis, two starkly contrasting pictures of their world began to unfold. A pre-Civil War Somalia, in which religion and culture were separate, and the Hobbesian present, in which life was indeed nasty, brutish, and short. In response to such constant insecurity and fear, Islamist conservatives had managed to erase the boundary between culture and religion and had induced a kind of cultural amnesia in many Somalis about their pre-Civil War mores. This was directly expressed in the stricter and stricter prohibitions women were being subject subjected to, most visibly in the way they dressed. This cultural amnesia didn't extend to everybody, of course. Edel Bulgas, my Somali translator who lived in Eastleigh, had embraced both Somali culture and Islam, while insisting on the difference between the two. She liked the dress in brightly colored sequin shawls and headscarves to set off the long gauzy tunic of her guntino, tie-dyed in midnight blacks and blues, a style worlds away from the austere, head-to-foot black shadors. She was completely at ease with Westerners like me, while scrupulously observing the Hadith about knocking, not shaking hands with men. And yet there were aspects of Somali culture that she was less than enamored with, particularly in regard to women's reproductive rights. On the way to visit the apartment that Edel shared with six other family members, we stopped at the maternity clinic where she worked, a low cinder block building with a muddy yard surrounded by a cinder block wall. Inside was almost like outside. The walls were unpainted concrete, the floor a poured concrete slab, the corridor almost bare except for some warm benches and chairs. The maternity ward held 20 beds in all, each with a green mosquito net bundled in rope above the bed, the mattresses broken backed and stained, the springs groaning ancient coils. Sister Sankali, the head nurse, who wore only a simple bandeau around her head, and a faded flower pattern blouse and skirt told me, we perform 60 deliveries a month. It is always hard to do follow-up. The men, you see, the men do not come the day that their wives deliver. Only the women's relatives are here to help. I asked where the men were. It's not part of the culture that a man should be present. So they are at home drinking tea she said, a little razor nick that made Edel smile. Somalis value large families, said Edel. Some men have several wives, whether they can afford to keep them or not, and the women have almost no rights. So when I first started working for my aid agency, they sent me to religious schools to talk about HIV and family planning. In one class, I was telling the women about means of contraception when a man claiming to be a sheikh stood up and said, that I was talking against the Koran and Islam, and that none of these methods can be used. 
that he accused me of being a spy. And so I told him that forcing women to start feeding a baby Nido infant formula so that she can again become pregnant is against Islam. And I reminded him that the Quran says that women must wait for two years between births. Was he willing to wait two years, I asked? She laughed. What do you think? Sister Sankali nodded. Just a few months ago, we had a woman come into the clinic who needed a cesarean section, but the men in her family did not want that. When I asked her why, she said, women are meant to bear children. If you deliver a baby that way, then that means you will probably have to deliver a baby that way again. So her husband kept refusing until it was too late. Then, to save her life, we not only had to take out the baby, but her uterus. That means, of course, that she could no longer have children. So her husband divorced her, and she went back to her family in disgrace. Sister Sankali frowned and shook her head. And we had an even worse case, the one that haunts me most. We told a Somali woman early on that her baby would too big for us to deliver it here. We told her to go to a regular hospital because she might need special surgery. But when her baby came due, she came here. We told her that if she wanted to save her and her baby's life, that she needed to go immediately to the hospital. And so she took a matatu to the hospital. But when she finally got there, she didn't have enough money, and so she came back. And by then, it was too late to do anything, and so she died. Sister Sankali's voice grew soft. Her husband came by the next day and asked where his wife was. He didn't even know that she was dead. Brooklyn, New York, 2019. I was talking with friends after I got back from Mogadishu, where I'd been finishing up an article about the lives of Somali refugees in East Africa. I'd just returned from seeing a famine firsthand, and one of them asked me how I felt after seeing so many starving people. It's difficult to answer a question like that coherently. The statistics more than 250,000 dead, the majority of them children, mean nothing because nobody is moved by a statistic. Plus, it's an experience so at a tangent to most Americans' ordinary lives that I did what I usually do. I avoided the question by saying something about being divided between here and there. The bright sun and red earth and drifting dust and deep-rutted dirt roads left by Land Rovers versus the computer buzz and hum of surfing the web to find mention of some British tourist shot to death by Somali pirates. But then my friend pressed me and said he hadn't asked what I thought, but what I felt, and insisted that I answer him. And honestly, I felt enraged. On the surface, a petty, cliched rage having to do with our cars and comforts. But underneath that, a rage with more substance, less stupidly self-involved. By watching people starving to death, you see why hunger is so degrading. A hungry person will be forced to do anything. If you're a mother walking with your two children to a refugee camp, you might have to leave the heavier one to die in the desert or die yourself of exhaustion. Or if you're a man and a bandit, you might push your fellow countrywoman, a refugee like yourself, at least until you became a bandit, off the top of one of the alarmingly overcrowded buses making its way to the camp. And while your fellow bandits are stealing goats or chickens, you carefully search through the woman's little bundles for money or jewelry or a cell phone. And if the woman isn't dead, 
you and your mates might drag her off into the bush and rape her as part of the bargain. We have all seen hundreds, maybe thousands of pictures of starving people. What do we learn from such pictures except to deflect them? We superimpose an image of Christ on the cross or see juxtaposed on the same page or screen a starving body next to a female model in a bathing suit thrusting her breasts at us or a male model flaunting his waxed, perfectly hairless chest. So I said to my friend that I didn't know what to do with such feelings and perceptions that they weren't exactly useful. If people are starving there, they aren't starving here. Or if they are, they aren't dying in the hundreds of thousands. And news photos of starving kids felt, to me at least, like a kind of disaster porn. And my rage was just part of that. A defense against a deeper lassitude, even despair. But I wasn't going to give up my car and comforts. And my rage felt and feels like a kind of can't. PTSD light, you could call it. And the only way I could adequately talk about what I felt was to describe a starving two-year-old boy. His head lolled in his mother's lap, and he seemed listless on the verge of coma, or the apathetic drowse that precedes it. But his mother had been given by one of the matrons of the feeding station in downtown Mogadishu a nutritional biscuit made of vitamin-fortified peanut slurry called plumpy nut. And as she carefully unwrapped it, whether from the smell or some inner alarm built into the species, he roused himself. She gave it to him. His eyes suddenly focused, and he began to eat. After a few bites, as the sugars hit his system, his whole body gathered strength, and he sat up, suddenly alert. He ate the biscuit slowly, and by the time he'd finished, he was taking in his surroundings particularly the shiny silver foil that the biscuit had come in. And he took the foil from his mother and began throwing it up in the air, playing with it, recovering in a few moments because of the sugars, the instinct to play. Six. Lamentation on Ur from a Babylonian spell, 2000 BC. Like molten bronze and iron, shed blood pools. Our country's dead melt into the earth as grease melts in the sun. Men whose helmets now lie scattered, men annihilated by the double-bladed axe. Heavy beyond help, they lie still as a gazelle, exhausted in a trap, muzzle in the dust. In home after home, empty doorways frame the absence of mothers and fathers who vanished in the flames remorselessly spreading, claiming even frightened children who lay quiet in their mother's arms, now born into oblivion like swimmers swept out to sea by the surging current. May the great barred gate of blackest night again swing shut on silent hinges destroyed in its turn. May this disaster, too, be torn out of mind. Thank you.
this, this place, could you proceed and sit at the table? Sure. We have uh, 10 or so minutes for uh, questions to our speakers. Where would you like us to sit, Sarah? Yeah, if, if you want to sit anywhere. Oh. There, right. You choose your, your place. Next to the mics, yeah. So if you want to ask questions, please come to the microphone and uh, ask your questions. Don't hesitate. Excellent lectures. So it's, uh, one lecture had a clear witness, the second lecture had a even more witness. So. But um, both lectures, in a kind of way, um, address the issue in the Middle East and in Africa and so on with quite negative you know, expectations or remarks. Is there any kind of lightning or you know, light aspects for the future in this? Or is this something they have to live with for the next couple of decades? Is it a question to both speakers? Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Is this? Well, since I was the downer, <laughs> um, I think I should start. I think it's a great question. I've asked. It's not on? Uh, do I need to? No, it's okay. Oh, it's Oh, can you hear me better now? Okay, better now. Okay. Well, as I said, since I'm the downer, I, I, I'll start. Um, and it's a question I wrestle with a lot. Uh, the um, here's my experience of it. When I was in uh, the Dab, uh, you know, they were in the middle of a terrible famine, and I met a um, guy who sells camels and goats. And uh, we started the talk, and he did the typical thing that people do. They, uh, uh, you know, as my friend here so beautifully pointed out, encounter is the key. And he just, you know, he asked me where I was from, and I said, I'm from New York. And he said, oh, the Knicks, New York Knicks. I said, yeah. He said, are you a Knicks fan? And I'm not. But I said, yeah, I like the Knicks. And then the conversation just started from there. And he basically asked me, well, you know, do you have, he was an older Somali man, so he had dyed his beard with henna. Uh, which is what many older Somali men do. And I said, well, why do you dye your beard with henna? He said, oh, my friend, for beauty. <laughs> and I said, well, you are indeed beautiful. And then I said to him, do you have uh, uh, any children? He said, yes, I have three wives and nine children. And then he looked at me and he said, and how many wives and children do you have? And I was immediately struck by the old Henny Youngman joke, you know, which like, only one child, and just, you know, only one child, one wife, and that's enough. And, you know, we all sat there and we laughed just uproarious, uproariously. And, you know, the things that I chose to choose today, uh, that I wanted to talk about today, were obviously the much grimmer aspects. But the thing I, I really need to say, and I think you're absolutely right to point this out, is that no matter what the circumstances of people's lives, no matter if they're starving to death, and I saw many people who were starving to death, until the very end, their whole lives are intact, their personalities are intact. If they were a pain in the ass uh, before they were starving to death, they're still a pain in the ass. Um, all of those things uh, don't ever get negated. And the thing about it is for me that I discovered in doing this work that none of these people is a kind of cipher for pity. But they all have amazingly unique, interesting lives. And that what I was drawn to, um, and today I gave kind of the downer version, I could have given the upper version, maybe I, I will next time. Uh, but there were many, many encounters uh, that I found which had just laughter and hilarity in the grimmest of circumstances. And, you know, the last story I'll tell, I was at a feeding station with a bunch of boys, 
And again, it was the same thing. Where are you from? New York, New York. Everybody, the Knicks, the Knicks, the Knicks. Everybody likes the Knicks in Somalia. Don't ask me why. And, and so we started to play a guessing game. And they would shout out to me, you know, I, I would say, I would try to guess everybody's name. And then they would say, guess how old we are? Because everybody wanted to try out their English. And, you know, the amount of English that people have always kind of, and I, my Arabic is crappy. So we went back and forth between my crappy Arabic and their, and, their, and their English, which was actually kind of wonderful to hear them speak. And then, and then we finally became this guessing game of how old we were. And I would say, how old are you? And then they would, and then they turned to me and said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 25. And they said, no, you're real. You're, no, you're not 20. Said, All right, I'm 35. And we went on and on and on like that until finally I said, OK, I'm 49. And then, of course, they all laughed at that. And then we just sat there and laughed. And in the meantime, as we were sitting there laughing, having a great time, we were slapping each other and high-fiving and you know doing the fist bump, all the stuff that you see. And over in the corner of my eye, uh, there was a large cooking pot, and the cooking pot had been used to feed the kids about an hour and a half ago. And inside the cooking pot was a goat, and the goat had climbed into the cooking pot and was licking out the remains of it. And this brought back to me the conversation that I'd had with the herdsman that I started with. And that is, I asked him, so how much are goats going for? And he said, eh. Nobody wants to buy goats anymore. The price has gone to hell. Last year, the price was this. This year, the price is this. And the reason for that is, who wants to buy a goat if you don't have anything to feed it? And that was really what it was like. Uh, very practical accommodations to very practical problems. The idea that there's ubiquitous tragedy there's a larger tragedy, absolutely. It's terrible to see what people go through. But in the moment-to-moment -moment experience of their own lives, they lead amazingly rich, and in my opinion, many of them, very positive lives, um, despite you know, the, the, off, the difficulties. Say something similar. In fact, if you look at the Lebanese war, during the war, there are many people who go to parties. And they go to hair salon to keep really themselves handsome and beautiful. I think one of the difference in between the past and today is the following. For example, we had talked of the genocide of 1914 and 15. And people who would survive would go to the neighboring countries in the same geography. Whereas today, people flee the Middle East and go to the West, which is far away. But there are also people from the East and the West who, in the face of gloominess, they have hope. They see behind the uh, clouds that the sun will appear when the clouds go. We have the experience of a Jesuit father from the Netherlands, uh, Father Franz van der Lucht, who had spent about 35 years in Syria. When he visited the Netherlands, his family and friends advised him not to go back. He said, no, my friends are over there. They need me. I'm going to be with them. And you have also a number of other stories. I can relate the story of about 100 families from Iraq, Syrian Orthodox, who fled the Iraqi war and took refuge in Syria. They settled in Jaramana, a suburb near Damascus. They said, well, our church is here, our patriarch is here, and Syria is peaceful, we are going to settle down here. They built a church for themselves, everything was going very well. And then the war started in Syria. 
They said, why don't we go back again to Iraq? Because things have improved a little bit. Lo and behold, again, the situation became worse and worse in Iraq. And sometimes people lose hope in the face of this turmoil. They say the Middle East needs many more years and generations to really settle down. And therefore, when there is an easy escape, a possible escape to a more peaceful place in the West, they do that. But if there is no escape, there are a number of people who do choose to remain. And we have also religious leaders, for example, who in the face of these calamities, they built churches, schools, and institutions who say that we are here no matter what. A day of peace, a day of tranquility will come. And they come also to an understanding that, as Kiera Lubich in a very poetic way says, only at night we see the stars. And sometime in the face of darkness and suffering, you are able to see the glimmer of hope.